this next guest was lauded on the television. This person has been described as one of the best surgeons in the country by the person who nominated her. Mm -hmm. Through their skill and dedication, they've enhanced the lives of so many of their patients by freeing them from crippling pain. The winner of the Healthcare Award is Suha El Neil. <laughs> She does is she makes she gives them a second chance of building their lives with their family um, to see the transformation it makes you it makes you believe uh, that uh, she is a miracle worker. I've worked with her for 16 years I feel very proud to be working with her I have great satisfaction in going home because of what she does for the patients She's a consultant, neurogynecologist, neuroneurologist at the University College London and a National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Welcome to her hashtag lockdown, no joke, uh, to so here we call her Susie El Neil. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> well Lovely to done. join you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that, Real pleasure. Yeah. Nice that. to meet you all. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Alaikum as salam. Very good, Eddie. It is our absolute pleasure to, to have you on. Thank you. It's a show that we came up with, and you can, you can hear, because I know you've been listening, uh, mm. talking about some of the things that we look at, we see, we feel, uh, that perhaps yeah. we don't hear represented. Um, certainly fibroids is, is one of those. Uh, mm. I'm understanding that the majority of women, particularly over 50, uh, have them. Uh, I'm understanding that they are disproportionately impacting the lives of uh, black women. Uh, and it is a joy and a pleasure to have you on here with us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, so what, sure. first of all, we'll start with the, the simple stuff. And I, I don't want to make you big and all of us, <coughs> you're the most important uh, thing in all of this. So we want to see you. We want to hear, mm -hmm. hear you. So what are fibroids, doctor? So uh, fibroids are basically what we would term benign tumors. In other words, they're not malignant, they're not nasty, but they are swellings uh, of the muscle, often found within the muscle of the womb. Uh, and they can be quite large and occupy the entire space. They can also exist attached to the womb, usually with a little stalk, or sometimes inside the cavity of the womb. So they can actually affect the lining of the womb and so on. So there is quite a, a it, its position though is all related to the womb specifically uh, and anything associated with it. Um, but basically they are benign tumors that affect the womb. Well, they, they may be benign and, you know, not cancerous, but they're mm. hugely debilitating, aren't they? Yeah, they have a massive impact on quality of life. Um, often you don't really know you have them, although uh, women from a uh, black heritage tend to have a propensity to have them more than other women. Um, but they can impact on everything from... Uh, women's periods to their fertility to even because of the size being so big can impact on their bladder their bowel and everything in the pelvis uh, it's quite they can be very overwhelming and very debilitating if they're not looked after or uh, or, or mm. indeed uh, surgically or medically treated I get the feeling that because it is where it is and it affects who it affects, it, it, it's one of those things that we have as a taboo. And when you have taboos where people don't talk about things, uh, it allows mistreatment, misunderstanding and huge discomfort. Am I wrong? Mm. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think women's health issues as a whole um, are really uh, a, a taboo subject. So if you speak to women about fibroids or speak to them about incontinence or things like pro mm -hmm. they, all these issues and FGM, I come from an FGM practicing community, you know, all these issues are social taboo subjects. As a whole, women uh, don't often talk about mm -hmm. uh, issues that affect them. They're known as women trouble 
marbles or women's bits and so on. Mm. So there is a tendency to deflect it. Uh, but yeah, the <laughs> impact is, it really, it, unless you start the conversation and have a dialogue, uh, you're not going to change uh, practice, focus, culture, mm. etc. Okay, so D Donna, thank you very <laughs> much for saying that you would talk about your own personal experience. Sure. Just tell us a little bit about what happened to you. So around about 2007, I started to notice I had a really big stomach. And I was thinking, where is this coming from? I didn't have any pain. Um, and I didn't realize that my monthlies were heavier, but I was just still carrying on. I was on stage obviously a lot of the time, but I couldn't understand what was going on. And then I remember one day I was on my way to, I think Shepherd's Bush, and there was a, I was getting off the bus and there was a pool of blood. To me, it seemed like a whole lot of pool of blood, but it, it wasn't, but it just seemed that way. It just, I was just scared. I got off the bus and I phoned my doctor straight away. And she said, well, you're, you are in your, I was in my late thirties then. She said, you know, you are 39, 40, it could be fibroids. I came in for a test. Um, and then obviously they told me I had fibroids, but well, I was told this thing. We're always told this thing that they're really small. You don't need to worry. And that, is where I always get upset because the very small grows very quickly. And then <clears throat> after that, I then had to wait maybe, I was in denial, I think really. I then went on, went to try and lose weight, lost the weight, but the stomach was still there. And then I took it seriously. And there were just so many things like yeah. I went to the doctor, um, um, one of the male doctors, I went to the hospital and he didn't even look at me because male surgeons, uh, male doctors are completely different to female ones. He didn't look at me. His head was down and he just went, yeah, could be a myectomy, could lead to a hysterectomy. I want to also play a, a lady called Chantel uh, who sent in a little video, which I think speaks to a lot of what um, Donna's just said. So, so let's have a listen to what Chantel said. What I take out of this whole experience, not just the mental also the physical kind of drainage out of it is the fact that i wish that i acted on it a lot sooner you know your body and you know when something isn't get quite right you need to go and check it out so my message to everybody is don't sit on things that you know is just not quite right in your body you know you and just don't sit on it, have a bit of faith, take that step and put your mind at rest. Because basically, if I went to my GP a lot sooner, got this diagnosed, and maybe I wouldn't have had fibroids as big as they were. They might have been a lot smaller to operate on. And don't sit on it. Don't sit on it. Please don't. So... Doctor, a lot, a lot to unpack there, but certainly with Chantel, you get the feeling that there's a lot more than she said there. Mm -hmm. It isn't easy to challenge a doctor. I, I don't feel right as a woman. I'm going with a bit of my body that is intensely personal to me, and I'm being told X or Y. Can you give us any help or guidance uh, as to what we should do or say there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the problems is you're absolutely right. There's a huge anxiety when you go into any medical or clinical facility, even your GP, um, to talk about this because of the time issues. And also you feel you're being a nuisance. And do remember a lot of women grow up being told that this is all normal, you know, heavy periods, yeah. normal, chronic yeah. pain, normal. You can't go to school. Well, that's you being difficult, but you know what? Mm -hmm. You can take some paracetamol and go to school. So, so a lot of little girls and women grow up with feeling they're always a nuisance about their health concerns. So that's the first obstacle. There's a self obstacle you have mm -hmm. to overcome. Mm -hmm. So the easiest thing I say to people, write it all down. Don't you go in there empowered with your story, your information, have it written down so that when you go in, you don't forget parts which are ex really critically important to you. So uh, one of the areas I also work in is chronic pain generally in women because that is very poorly looked after for women. And mm. often I'll say to them, don't forget, you know, what is it that is causing the issue for you and make sure you note it down. Once you've got it all written down, when you go in, if anybody's sort of making you feel quite 
awful or not helping you through it, say, look, you know, I'm here. This is a matter that's affecting my life. If you don't have enough time for me today let me know because then i need another appointment and actually that makes a lot of people sit up Brilliant. because they start to think oh okay i'm obviously not communicating things properly right. um yeah, so that's the st first step and then just do your homework don't be complacent uh, i know we say it all the time about many things but just read a little bit more and the nhs websites have got a lot of information on them they're not always perfect but they're useful and they can give you guidance so you can go in and say i want to know is this going to be helpful for me? Is this going to affect my fertility, my future, etc.? And that's one of the issues. And I and I just heard what Donna said. That story I've heard so many times. Mm. The dismissiveness of mm. coming in and being told, "Well, you have this operation or that operation. Out you mm. go. I'm done." You know. And you have to make the point that you're not done and you're here to discuss it with an expert. And what I've suggested to some women is if you feel one expert has not listened to you, say, I'd like to see another. Never, That's never go with one opinion. If you're not happy, it makes no sense to you. Go for a second, go for a third, go for a fourth, but That's go right. and get all the opinions you need. Never go with the so-called plan A. There are many other possible plans available. Yeah. Uh, let, let's just get, because I need to get as many questions or points or suggestions as possible. I want to say thank you again, Susie, uh, for talk. doing this for us. Mm -hmm. uh, if I get the boss lady on now. Um, boss lady, what sorts of questions Hello. are coming in? Hi. Um, Marilyn says, what causes fibroids and how can we prevent them from de developing? So that's a really interesting and important question because actually to date, nobody knows what causes fibroids. And if you read your textbooks at medical school, they'll say to you, the fi a fibroid is a tombstone of an unhappy womb. So they, they because women started delaying ch uh, childbirth to years later, just the way society developed. So there was that concept put into to women. Uh, there is a relationship with some of the female hormones, in particular progesterone. Uh, so there is a belief that people who have different progesterone levels or impact of progesterone on their body can have a, uh, an impact on fibroids. But actually, nobody knows why they happen. They happen. Another question, uh, someone recently had a miscarriage and was told by the nurse it was due to fibroids in the uterus muscle. Um, she spoke to someone from the Caribbean who said there's medication that can be taken to reduce the fibroids. Are there any medications available in the UK? So miscarriages are common in women. One in four pregnancies will end in a miscarriage. So that's the first thing. The uh, fibroids within the muscle of the womb are not usually associated with miscarriage. More commonly, you'll get miscarriage if the fibroids encroaching into the cavity of the womb. So it's disturbing the lining mm. and the level of <laughs> implantation. So it's quite important to get a very detailed ultrasound scan with a specialist to work out exactly where your fibroids are and if they're impacting on the cavity. With regards to the medication, there's a large number of medications that are available, but they are mainly hormonally uh, dependent medications. So if you take them, often if you can take them for a period of time where the fibroid could shrink or reduce in size, etc., they're useful. But often if you're trying to get pregnant, they're actually countering your ability mm. to get pregnant. So you have to know, uh, you have to speak to a, an expert who's also a fertility expert as well as a fibroid expert and combine those two together. Again, do your homework. Not everything that is stated and said is actually helpful. What are the symptoms and can they prevent you from having children? So the symptoms are many. Sometimes no symptoms mm. at all. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's pain. Uh, typically, it's heavy periods, uh, and many women will tell you they just pass clots and blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, they can prevent you from having children, depending on their location, their size, and so on. But none of this is insurmountable, and there are many ways to treat them and actually individualize the treatment for, your pay for yourself so that you can have children. I was diagnosed in October 
by a doctor and it was convinced it was cancer. Awful experience. I would like to know, having previously had a stroke and taken aspirin, what are my treatment options? Because it appears they are limited. So it depends on, again, coming back to where are they, how big are they, what impact they're having directly. So you would treat them symptomatically. If it's heavy bleeding, there's a track you can use. If it's uh, pressure problems, there's another track you can use and so on. So some would involve medication, some would involve surgery. If you're on aspirin, then there's a higher risk of your bleeding becoming much more of a problem, particularly if you're still having periods. So you need to then look at alternative therapies and treatments to work with that. There are lots of ways to get around it and it's not always down one street. The options are there. They're not always discussed. So that's where I come back to first, second, third, fourth opinion. Get those opinions and, li and get them from experts in the domain that's causing you the symptom as well as the fibroids. So if you have pain, speak to a pain expert. So if you have problems with bleeding and strokes and so on, speak to a neurologist who looks after your stroke and get information about alternative therapies that would not have an impact on your fibroids and so on. Uh, this woman has fibroids and due to COVID, her operation was rescheduled and she wants to know if there's any food she sh should be eating and how to overcome the constant tiredness and lower back pain. So if do, you do you deal with prevention as well as cure then, doctor? So uh, we don't, uh, generally by the time we see them, we are in the, we've gone into the cure rate rather than the prevention. Um, but the approach is multifaceted. And so dietary, so weight loss we know helps. So that's what Donna did, you know, trying to lose weight actually makes mm -hmm. a big difference and gets your hormones more in balance. The key is your hormones. If yeah. you can get your progesterone yeah. estrogen levels in the right place, and you can mm -hmm. do that through dietary control as well but it's never as good as actually doing the weight thing and making sure mm. that's uh, spot on make sure you don't have any problems with your thyroid we know women with a low thyroid hormone have worse bleeding so yeah. check on that as well so you can start looking at all the foods that go with estrogen progesterone and thyroid and yes some people find them helpful not everybody does coming to the question of the back problem and causing the pain and so on again weight loss exercise physiotherapy back strengthening exercises a lot of us sit in chairs for a long time doing all sorts of things day in day out uh, if you do not learn to strengthen your erector muscles of the spine mm -hmm. and actually strengthen them so that you sit better you walk better you stand better actually simple interventions like that or make a big difference to the impact of the fibroid in the pelvis. So I yeah. think it's a question of listen to your body, take the action that would work for you uh, and work through it and get advice appropriately as and when. Is, is there an age range with fibroids? So most women are badly affected by their fibroids, I'd say reproductive years. So between roughly 18 up till about your early 50s. However, there is a belief that once you go into the menopause, your fibroids shrink and you're okay. That's not always the case. That's, That's not always the case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so a lot, of the a lot of the time, the fibroids might reduce in size. One, you look at all the studies, it's roughly by a third. So if you've got a massive nine centimeter fibroid and it shrinks to six, it's still going to be giving you similar problems mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah? yeah. So, so yes, it can reduce. The important thing is again, talking, uh, looking at your symptom and focusing on your symptom and working within that range of therapies that are available, whatever the treatments are. Uh, and my belief is you don't have to be on a tablet. You should use multiple approaches. And I think that's what works for most women. How do fibroids differ from endometriosis? So fibroids are very much a tumor so it's a solid piece of muscle uh, endometriosis the easiest way to describe it it's like the lining of the womb mm -hmm. instead of staying within the womb has somehow escaped and is elsewhere in the body so mm -hmm. it's lying on top of the womb it's lying around the ovaries the bladder the bowel now mm -hmm. every time you have a period and you bleed that same tissue does exactly the same thing. Mm. 
Mm. And the problem is because it's in an abnormal position, it causes pain and discomfort and eventually scarring and other issues in mm. those places. So if it's on top of the ovary, your ovaries will hurt. If you, it's on top of your bowel, your bowel will hurt, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is actually just, it's a bit like you've taken something and just thrown it throughout the pelvis mm. so everything becomes covered in it you've like painted it with mm. endometriosis so it's quite a different disease condition i am so sorry uh, to the messages we can't get to at the moment but it's my dream along with the team to be able to keep it going and if we can then maybe susie will come back and talk to us susie lovely I, I, I want to talk to you, you know, you, you've talked just a few things from my perspective, if you don't mind. You've sure. talked a lot today about the physical impact. Yeah. And certainly with Chantel and with some of the women who have trusted me enough to talk to me about this. What we haven't talked about is the mental trauma, yeah. meeting yeah. somebody, yeah. not knowing oh, whether you can be uh, friendly, what to wear, where to mm -hmm, go, how mm -hmm, you look, mm -hmm, who you can mm -hmm. tell. Might we talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Uh, um, I think that is uh, something that is prevalent through out medicine. I think um, mm. one of the biggest problem is when you put yourself and you are the patient, your anxiety, first of all, to even talk about any subject matter that affects your health is, is a worry. Um, you're dependent on your GP and most GPs are very good and they can give you guidance and they refer you to their local reserve, their local sources. So the local hospital down the road who, if they can't deal, they'll send you somewhere else. The emotional trauma, I, I think, having looked after a lot of women with rather complex problems, is the one thing that comes across time and time and time again is the emotional trauma, the mm. psychological long-term trauma, which people tend to underplay, which can take years to get over, and the dismissiveness of some of us in the profession. So one of yes. the, the, and I think a lot of women, <clears throat> if you speak to them, they will the story is not yeah. that different. It's very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hence why I said go in armed with your tools, which is what you've written. Don't mm -hmm. wait. You are in the driving seat. You drive mm -hmm. the conversation. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't sound right, move on. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the important thing from the psychological aspect is you will be heard. It might take mm -hmm. a bit of time, but you will yeah. be heard. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep on pushing on that door. Don't give up. Um, and if it matters right. it, it to you, don't stop. Don't stop. It's sometimes oh, you right. feel you need to give up. And I think, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the, the program you showed earlier about the award was mainly that. It was listening to the women and then trying to develop a way to help the women. Um, and that's me, but there are others who are there mm -hmm. that can do the same thing. So just keep knocking at that door. Don't let it go. It is fantastic what you're doing. Everything yeah. I've read about you yes. tells me yes. about the kind yes. of people. It's not just about being a doctor, yes. it's about being uh. a human being. It's about listening, yes. it's about uh. having, you know, emotional yes. intelligence, empathy. This impacts on so many women's lives. You yeah. know I have a particular interest in FGM, which we haven't got to. Yeah. You know I have a particular interest in the mesh A yeah. being put in and then yeah. being taken out. So might I ask you one day, if we haven't been to, I don't know, horrible to you, would you come back? <laughs> <laughs> of course I would, Eddie. It would be my privilege and honour to do so. Thank you. Uh, I, of course I would. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. You. And thank you so much for your time today. Not you at all. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.